Good morning, everybody. Welcome on in to your Sunrise Book Club for today. Today, we're doing something a little different. It's not just going to be a classic cryptid tale. You're going to be learning with me. And what we are reading from is a book I've been really excited to read. And I figure, I mean, what better time to do it than with you all, right? Uh, and we're going to learn about the mechanics of consciousness. consciousness. It's a book called Stalking the Wild Pendulum. The Mechanics of Consciousness by one Itzak Bentov. Now, Itzak Bentov was a self-taught scientist and researcher from back in the day, 60s, let's say. And he really dived, delved deeply into what consciousness is and what it might be and the powers that we have with it. He did this through all sorts of research and experiments. Uh, this book... Stalking the Wild Pendulum was actually used by the CIA to create their gateway program. So if you're out there and you see that PDF floating around, most of the charts and most of the information comes from this book right here. So if you're not familiar, the gateway program with the CIA, or which at least in one of the documents they released, is a psychic program uh, that <clears throat> teaches the people who are a part of it, or it's a report on using these methods, how to remote view, move objects with your mind could basically all the runs the gamut of psychic powers we are actually able to do in this book delves into how and why so we're going to jump right into that we're going to start just with the introduction here to get us going so i'm going to flip over to my live scene and i figure i'm doing this so i could learn as I stream because I've been meaning to dive into this but it's hard to find time so we're gonna read for a little bit then we're gonna reward ourselves with a little bit of gaming after that where we're gonna what we're gonna play today who knows we'll decide that uh, when we get there but okay excellent so we are reading from stalking the wild pendulum we're gonna start with the introduction this book is the result of some living room discussions that I had with friends over a period of time. They became more and more elaborate as topics were added to the original discussions. Eventually, my friends felt that presenting these ideas to a broader audience would be in order. Finally, I gave in to the well-intentioned nagging of my friends and put down some of these ideas on paper. As I sat down to write, I wondered whether it was the right time to do so. The accumulation of knowledge is so con is a continuous process and it is difficult to say at what point one should say stop here and write down whatever information has accumulated up until now i have decided to start writing at my present level of ignorance simply because of the circumstances circumstances forced me to do so do so it is certain that i could describe many things better and add many new ideas if i were to start this book two or three years from now however I would still face the same situation because one's level of ignorance increases exponentially with accumulated knowledge. Remember that. I think that's a super, I, I try and live by that. The more you know, the less you know. And I love that. It's just like it's inspiring too. If you have something in you, something you want to create, just do it. It's no time is better than the present. It doesn't matter if you're going to like, even if you know more, there'll still be holes in it. There'll still be more you can do always. So you just got to go for it. I totally forgot to put an ice cube in this. Well, it's still cold. I got coffee in Homer's head today. It's still cold because I use like cold milk and water and stuff. But I forgot to put an ice cube in it. I'm like, oh, it's not that cold. I'm shocked. Okay. <clears throat> For example, when one acquires a bit of new information, there are many new questions that are generated by it, and each new piece of information breeds five or ten new questions. These questions pile up at a much faster rate than does the accumulated information. The more one knows, therefore, the greater his level of ignorance. This effect does seem to justify my decision to publish this information now. Exactly. Good point. He's just gonna be more ignorant the more time goes by to things. <clears throat> and that's what's really interesting. There's another, it's like a, what was another, I believe it was like an Eastern religion philosophy book, maybe Hindu. 
that talked about how like yeah the accumulation of knowledge even when it is towards something like spiritual is still a like egocentric path it's not truly you're not going to get to enlightenment or anything that just from reading and accumulating knowledge you're still accumulating these things it's just an interesting idea Therefore, I do not claim that the information contained here is the final truth, but I hope that it will stimulate more thinking and speculation by future scientists interest and interested laymen. Much of the information has come through intuitive insight, which is no just justification, of course, for omitting a rational support for this material. When we come to the description of the shape of the universe and the process of its creation, however, a rational support becomes tenuous since we are dealing with material that cannot fully, cannot be fully supported yet by scientific facts. Here the principal guide for judging the material presented is one's intuition or subjective experience. <clears throat> The book is designed for young people of all ages, by which I mean those whose imagination has not yet been stifled by the standard educational process, right? I mean, I'm a teacher. I come from that standard educational process. And let me tell you, the whole purpose of that process, whether we like to admit it or not, is to strip away creativity and to strip away individuality and make someone a citizen and turn someone into a citizen who is going to leave school and operate go to work, get married, have kids, go to the store, go to movies, watch TV, whatever it may be. That is what school is built to do. I know that's not the original purpose, but that's what it's become. Especially schools in America, they were based on the factory model system because when the Model T came out, they thought, hey, you know what, that's a great idea. Let's make this just like school. Let's make it a factory for young minds. Well, it doesn't work because the brain is very complex and every child's brain is like a flower and it needs different every it needs different care it needs different ways of learning each everyone does we all have different learning modalities and they're vastly complex because of who we are it's a mystery how people learn but he's dead on right here when your mind is young it's fresh and it's ready to take on ideas that an older mind is not ready for i went through this very journey when i was uh, entered my 20s and I became super skeptical about everything super skeptical super curmudgeon -y. uh and you know then I moved up to the mountains a few years ago and things have changed things have changed in a way that I took a complete 180 taking a breath of fresh air and kind of taking my mind off of a lot of things that I was either addicted to or on a cycle with whether it be the shows I watched the social media I consumed whatever it was or the news just stepping away from all that really helped open my mind again because there is a dogma that's like pushed onto us whether it's uh that's interesting but excellent i totally agree the educational process is strips you away it stifles you it is written for people i'm not that doesn't mean school's bad there are still some dope teachers trying to you know ignite that fire in you uh it's just to say that school could be a lot better <laughs> It is written for people who can still be awed by the way ants build their burrows, by the cold elegance of a snake, or the beauty of a flower. I'm writing for people who can tolerate a temporary state of ambiguity, for those who can take change easily and are not afraid of handling wild ideas. Those who cannot tolerate change will drop out very quickly. Few scientists will read this book to the end, but I do hope that it will stimulate the thinking process and implant some ideas into the minds of future scientists. Those who will be at their peaks about the end of this century. Oh yeah. I am attempting in this book to build a model of the universe that will satisfy the need for a comprehensive picture of what our existence is all about. In other words, a holistic model that encompasses not only the physical, observable universe that is our immediate environment and that the distant universe observed by our astronomers, but also realities as well. Normally, we do not consider the emotional, mental, and intuitive components of our beings as realities. I will try to persuade you that they are. The phenomena that we call unexplained like psychokinesis, the moving of an object with the power of the mind, telepathy, out-of-body experiences, 
clairvoyance, etc., through remote viewing, can be explained once we know the general underlying principles governing them. Recently, we have, sorry, recently there has been a great deal of controversy concerning these subjects. The majority of laymen and most scientists do not present presently believe in the existence of such phenomena. I think that still holds true today. Rather than getting ourselves involved in the controversy over possibilities of telepathy or whether one can function out of this body or not, I will try to demonstrate the underlying mechanisms and explain how these things might work. It will be left to the reader to decide whether the explanations I am suggesting make sense or not. First, I suggest that the general underlying principle in all phenomena mentioned above is an altered state of consciousness. <clears throat> These altered states allow us to function in realities that are normally not available to us. And when he's talking about altered states of consciousness, this could be several things. We're talking uh, states induced by uh, psychedelic drugs, hypnosis, being in a state of sleep. What do they call that? People astral project, what is that? REM sleep, when you're in your, oh gosh, why am I forgetting that? But you know what I'm talking about, lucid dreaming is another state of altered consciousness. These altered states allow us to function in realities that are normally not available to us. By normally, I mean our usual waking state of consciousness. Furthermore, there are many levels of consciousness or rea realities that are available to the person who can so regulate himself. I shall try to fit these realities into an orderly spectrum. When taken together, all these realities form a large hologram of interfacing fields in my model. Most of us see the universe through a tiny window, which allows us to see just a single color. Just a single color or reality out of the endless spectrum of realities. Viewing our universe through this tiny window forces us to see the world in sequential form. That is, as events that follow each other in time. This is not necessarily so. <clears throat> the concept of a model, as I'm using it here, generally implies to a theoretical construct that fits as many of the known facts as one has available into a neat, elegant, and compact package. A good model will also allow the prediction of the behavior of the elements or components of this structure. This is a good test for the validity of the model. Also. It is nice to have a model that does not violate any presently accepted physical laws, so as not to step on anyone's toes or cause any hassles. I believe that the model I am introducing complies with these requirements, although it comes very close to the edge of, a present, no of present knowledge. But then there is nothing wrong with trying to nudge the edge a tiny bit further. But a model is a model. And sorry, but a model is a model only and not the absolute truth. Therefore, it is, a sub it is subject to change as new information appears on the horizon. When one model does not suffice to account for all the phenomena, a new one will have to be built. So basically, he, what he just did right there is he's breaking down the process of science for us. You get a big hypothesis or a model of an idea of how something's supposed to work, and you make a model of it, and that stands until there's new information or new knowledge kind of like pushes that model off the pedestal. And then there's a new model that encompasses all the phenomena. So he, what we're going to do with this book is we're building a map. What Itzhav Bentov does is he builds a model for consciousness, what consciousness is and how it operates. <clears throat> the theory of rel relativity, a little, little, the theory of relativity emphasizes the notion that no matter what we observe, we always do so relative to a frame of reference that may differ from someone else's, that we must compare our frames of reference in order to get meaningful measurements and results about the events we observe. Interesting. Yeah, relatively, that's, that is relativity. I really didn't know that. That's really, that's interesting. So it's like, it's all relative. <laughs> It's all relative to someone. Your point of view is going to differ from anyone else's, so you have to compare everyone's point of view and get that down the middle line. The quantum theory asserts that there is no way one can measure some sets of things, like momentum and position, together very accurately. It suggests, at least in one widespread interpretation, 
that this is so because the consciousness of the experimenter interacts with the experiment itself. Therefore, it becomes possible that the attitude of the experimenter must also influence the outcome of any particular experiment. experiment. Now, this is serious business, for unless we are able to account for, for and describe what consciousness is, it will always put any experiment in doubt. So the problem is, what is consciousness? And that's a fact that like, that always blows my mind thinking about that, that at the quantum level, our consciousness affects things like there are, you know, atoms, spooky movement, quantum entanglement, whatever it is, there are things that only do things when observed. And when not observed, they're doing they're acting and being something else. So that is very, that's really interesting. When you think about science in general, all the experiments, theories that have done before, what role has consciousness played in the past in those things? But to even start there, we have to learn like what is consciousness in the first place. Is it, yeah, is, let's keep going. If you leaf through this book, you will see a lot of diagrams and you may have the impression that this is a technical or even scientific book. So I'll make sure we show any diagram that he shows, I'll show as we're learning together. Well, don't worry about that. I myself in a fair, am a fairly stupid fellow. <laughs> who could not learn any mathematics at all. In fact, my brush with academia was a rather short one. I was expelled from kindergarten at the age of four for some alleged subversive activities and have never managed to resume normal studies since, not to mention graduating from any place. So my mind has remained blank and unspoiled by higher learning. So this guy, oh, I love that he's like, you know, he's risen to the ranks of scientists in the most old school way. And he gets respect from the community in the most old school way. I mean, the CIA based their research on his research. So, I mean, what, what are we doing here? And he didn't have to go to college. He full was expelled from kindergarten. Now, I'm not saying that's the path for everyone and you should do that. But unfortunately, the only really good path to cool learning right now, unless you're completely independent and you're able to do it, which by all means, go for it, is the education system we have. But just super interesting. I mean, I really, I love that. It just shows you, you know, these structures we've built, you could rise beyond things without their help. <laughs> so my mind, oh, we already did that. In order for us to develop a common language, I have to utilize some elementary concepts in science, such as the behavior of sound and light waves. And finally, a hologram. I have tried to make the description of this behavior as palatable. Sorry. I've tried to make the description of this behavior as easy as possible and as short as possible. I have to convey to you how nature works by simple examples that will suffice perfectly to handle the final concepts. I suggest, therefore, that you bear with me for the first four chapters. Beyond that, it's all downhill and fun, all right? So we're starting our journey with this. We have to start with chapter one and we're gonna learn how sound waves work and how sound waves work in conjunction. Oh, it's just, we're, that's what we're gonna get. I mean, I have no idea how any of this stuff works. I didn't, I didn't pursue science or mathematics at all in my educational journey. I was more of an English and history guy. So I read a lot and learned a lot about, you know, stuff in that realm. So I'm excited to dive in with someone who has the language for us, more of a layman language to explain what this stuff is. But after chapter four, things become pretty outrageous because I rush into places where even angels fear to tread. I consider angels to be fairly timid, unenterprising. I consider angels to be a fairly timid and unenterprising bunch. One of the points of this book is to show that when information about subjects like poltergeist phenomena, psychokinesis, ESP, ghost, telepathy, psychic healing, spontaneous mystical experiences, etc., is organized into a reasonable order, we can find that these phenomena are manifestations of consciousness on increasingly higher levels. I will, for example, handle, handle reincarnation as a matter of fact, completely disregarding the great controversy that rages over the subject. There are two reasons for this. So this is why this author considers reincarnation, old Mr. Bintov, old Dr. Bintov, why he considers reincarnation a fact. I mean, as do I. There are two reasons for this. First, the simple fact that when one puts himself into the proper level of consciousness, one may obtain this information firsthand. Second, we know that the energy cannot be lost within a closed system. 
the main characteristic of the phenomenon of life is that it counteracts the general tendency of things to run down. This is a system containing a higher degree of order and will tend to run down toward a state of disorder while dissipating the availability of energy. Let us take the human body as an example. Yeah, please explain what you just said to me. Let us take the human body as an example. In order to keep ourselves alive, we have to eat. But what do we eat? We eat either animal, vegetable, or mineral, or mineral products. But where do these come from? The vegetables or grasses take suitable minerals from the soil of our planet, put order into them, and organize them into molecules that are used to build live cells of the plant. Some of these cells are digestible by our digestive systems, and some are not. We and other plant-eating animals eat the plant material and organize it into a more, complex mo a more complex molecule, a protein, found in meat. Man and other predators have the choice of eating <clears throat> directly the protein built up by plant-eating... Sorry. Man and other predators have the choice of eating directly the protein built up by plant-eating animals. <clears throat> the DNA of our chromosomes which contain the information required to build extra copies of our bodies are extremely stable substances. Very rarely do we find gross errors within that system. That is, we encounter few people who have two noses, three legs, etc. <clears throat> our physical properties are well guarded within our chromosomes, down to the very finest detail, and a very high degree of order and stability is maintained there. This shows how life organizes random minerals into a very stable structure and maintains this order for a long period of time. <clears throat> this is called negative entropy. What? Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> now, what happens when we die? The organizing life energy departs and our bodies start decomposing rapidly. Our precious information carrying proteins decompose into badly smelling substances within three days. Within time, in the grave, these substances will be broken down into simpler ones. We have returned to the planet. The substances we borrowed, sorry. We have returned to the planet, the substances we borrowed from it. So we go back from whence we came. But there is another component to life other than the physical body. And this is the part of the, the component of life he was talking about earlier that most people ignore, the realm of emotions and energy. <clears throat> we know that during our lifetime, we build up and store enormous amounts of information. That information is also energy that is becoming organized. In childhood, the events that occur to us seem to be random and unconnected, a kind of fallout from the world of grown-ups. As we grow up, we begin to recognize the patterns and events and their causes. In short, we put order into them. This order is analogous to the order of life. This order is analogous to the order of... So we have all our memories and we put them in order, just like how plants break down molecules and put them in order and create a protein our minds take information and break it down and then organize it. And as we grow up, we begin, to re we begin recognizing the patterns of events and their causes. In short, we put order into them. This order is analogous to the order the life force has put into the minerals to organize and integrate them into a living material body. So yeah, it's kind of like he was saying, he's making that parallel between what we just read about, which was how physical things break down molecules, create protein and energy. We do the same thing just with information. During a human lifetime, we organize a lot of information on many levels. Emotional information is built up, mental information is built up, etc. This information bundle is not material, although some will say that it is the brain that contains it. What we have here is a body of information. It is a non-material entity containing all the knowledge that we have accumulated over a lifetime, including our personality traits and character. <clears throat> it is the non-material us. In life, we deal therefore with two organizing systems, one material and one non-material. At the time of death, the physical system decays and disorder sets in. 
Will the same thing happen to the non-physical energy system? This system, which I shall call the psych, is an organizer and processor of this information. And that information is stored outside our physical bodies. And that is true. That's actually been proven. The consciousness is inside our bodies and outside our bodies, all of our consciousnesses. So we're all connected in that way as well. I assert that the psych can exist independent of the physical body, that this thinking and knowing part of us is conserved. It is non-physical and therefore not subject to decay after the death of the physical body. This body of information will eventually be absorbed in the large reservoir of information produced by all my mankind, the super consciousness, which I shall call the universal mind. So that's what we're going to call it, the universal mind or the super consciousness. However, this will occur over a very long period of time. It may take many thousands or millions of years for this to happen. Thus, nothing is lost. The physical body is reabsorbed by the planet and the body of information is also absorbed back from whence it came. No organized energy is ever lost. An experiment showing the independence of the psych from the physical body is described in chapter four. Well, I can't wait to get there. In short, I suggest that people having problems with accepting the concept of reincarnation consider this bundle of organized information as having contin con continuity in time. While the physical body serves as just a temporary vehicle for the psych, when the psych, after having been without the physical body for a while, decides that it needs additional pieces of information obtainable only through the physical body, it will acquire one and continue to associate with the new body until it wears out and dies. So that is kind of a beautiful, that not kind of at all, that is a beautiful description of what reincarnation might be or is, <clears throat> depending on where you fall on the belief spectrum. It's a description of what it is. We have two, and I'm just summarizing for myself so I can remember here as we move forward. What Bintov, I believe, is saying here is that there we have two organizing systems within ourselves. There is the physical, which is our body that organizes, you know, everything that we do, everything we eat organizes it into energy. Uh, <clears throat> and when we die, that decays and goes back into the earth. But there's also something else that governs us, and that is the psyche. That is the non-physical organizer of information, memories, and everything we've learned during our time on Earth. <clears throat> that does not decay. That gets sucked back up into the universal mind in a way at, at one point, not necessarily immediately, after the physical body decays. So after the physical body decays, that psyche floats into the universal mind or the super consciousness, and that information, whoop, is then added to the wealth of information that already exists. And when that consciousness needs more information, boom, it's got a physical body to put itself into what it's created to learn more. Reincarnation. Nature, as I hope to show later, needs all this information, which is organized, ener which is organized energy, and will not allow it to go to waste. It will be stored in nature's large information storage hologram, the universal mind. Normally, we have no recollection of previous lives due to the self-protective mechanism similar to that which prevents us from bringing up material, material buried deep in our subconsciousness. While in the last few years we have been witnessing a great increase in the area of psychic phenomena, still major the majority of people suffer from what one may call the giraffe syndrome, which goes as follows. One nice day, an elderly resident of the Bronx decides to visit the zoo. As he walks along admiring the unusual animals, he suddenly finds himself staring at a set of very tall legs. As he lifts his eyes, he finds the belly of the animal connecting those legs. He keeps looking up, and all he sees is neck, neck, and more neck. And then, somewhere up in the clouds ahead. No, he says. This is impossible. There is no such animal. And with that, he turns away from the giraffe and walks calmly on, not casting even a single glance back at it. Most people have the giraffe syndrome when it comes to these controversial areas, especially so, especially so affected our scientists. With the exception of a very few pioneering spirits, the problem is that they view reality through a tiny window and they like to stay within the frame of that window. They decide that if the giraffe is too big for their window, then it's too bad for the giraffe. As far as they are concerned, it is non-existent. 
Fortunately, the levels of consciousness into which I divide the different phenomena are easily available so that anyone who is willing to spend the time and effort does not need to rely on my description of things. He can go to the zoo and see things for himself. I must apologize to women readers for calling the creator a he. A creator is neither he or she, but both. But somehow I couldn't bring myself to call him chairperson of the universe. I don't think he would go for that, nor could I face him in good consciousness afterwards. So hey, that's a good that's a good note. And at the bottom here, there's a little there's a little symbol. So I'm gonna share this with you all as we're learning together. That must be his symbol, but there we go. The symbol of the expanded mind. Of the seeker. All right. Whoop. Woo! Oh, I'm still using my animation. I gotta get rid of that scene. I'm trying to go. I'm trying to trying to switch when I switch. I'm trying to switch only to this one. More, more stripped down, and you get to be closer to me. You know, I could be close. I get to feel closer to you. But that is the introduction. So what we're gonna dive into next, like the author mentioned, like old Mr. Bentov mentioned here, we're gonna learn about sounds, waves, and vibrations, and what they have to do with consciousness and this universe. Basically, we're gonna learn the laws of nature, and we're starting with the first law in this book, sounds, waves, and vibration. Then after we get through these first four chapters, we'll get to jump into the crazy stuff, the explanations of telekinesis, telepathy, all that fun stuff, the consciousness, the super consciousness, the levels of mind, all that. We'll, we're going to get to dive into that after we get through the basic laws of nature. You got to walk before you could run. <clears throat> so chapter one, let me see here. What do we got? What do we got in these pages? How, how many pages are this? Chapter one, how dirty are you? We'll probably read part of chapter one. I'm gonna go until I feel the itch of the video games. Okay, maybe we can. Maybe we can maybe we can do it all today. Let let's let's uh let's shoot for the moon, why don't we? Sounds, waves, and vibration. We are constantly surrounded by sound. We even have a highly specialized opening in our heads for making sounds that may be meaningful to other people. We communicate through sound. In fact, it is our major means of communication. When we disturb the air in any way, we create sound. The slightest motion of our bodies disturbs the air around us, and we produce sound. When we raise our hand, we compress the air in its way. And that compressed air, that compressed air front will travel away from us at a speed of sound, which is about 740 miles an hour. So watch this. I just sent like 10 sound waves into the freaking universe going 740 miles per hour. When we make periodic movements with our hands, the sound becomes a note. By sound, we mean here, sorry. By sound, we mean here any random acoustical disturbance that may be composed of many different frequencies. A note, on the other hand, is a sound of a single frequency. Okay. It may not be audible because of its low frequency. We call this kind of sound infrasound. It is the sound below our level of perception. However, when a fly or mosquito beats its wings, it does it fast enough and we sure can hear it. The rapid flapping of its wings produces evenly spaced compressions and rarefications of the air that become audible to us. In short, a flyer mosquito is producing a sound or a note. And that is easily discerned by us in the real world because, you know, that's true. You could hear a fly flying by. But here is just interesting uh, what he was talking about with the denser air and the rarefied air. So the denser air starting out closer to the object. And then when the whoop, 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 whoop. Sorry, let me get this better for you. There we go. So the bottom here, whoops. Oh gosh, there we go. So this one is the densi densified air, kind of near the hand, right? Then when I started moving my hand like a wild man, that becomes more rarefied air. That's where it's spreading out and creating those sound waves. And if you look here, it's kind of how it would look on a chart if we were measuring the sound waves created by someone moving their hand. And right here too, he also has a chart of what it is for a mosquito or a fly when you see it, that they are producing those sound waves. You see it coming off of there. And this is a pure note, the pure note of a mosquito's wings would look something like that, if charted. 
Let us try to make sound in a less obvious way. We shall take a short piece of wire, connect both of its ends to a battery through a switch. Oh, cool. Now we're going to describe some experiments. Let us try to make sound in a less obvious way. We shall take a short piece of wire, connect both of its ends to a battery through a switch, and close the switch. I'm going to show you what that's going to look like. So this is what he's talking about. And we're going to create sound with this. Not intermission. So if you look here, this is the experiment we're talking about. We have the wire, right? Connected on both ends here. And by closing the switch, she just means connecting it all. Yo, good morning, Asteria. Welcome on in. Uh, welcome in to catch you up a little bit. What we're learning about today. I'm doing something a little different on, I think on Thursdays. You're gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna learn together. Uh, Cause I've been, I have all these new books I've been wanting to get into and haven't had the time to read. So I was like, if we're gonna do, I'm gonna, we're gonna do it together on stream. So what we're reading today. Oh, woo thank you, Asteria. I know it is my affiliate anniversary. What is up? I can't even believe it's been such a wild journey. Uh, what we're reading today, I appreciate that. Thank you, Asteria. I hope your morning is going as good as mine is. And I hope you're, you yeah, got a good day ahead of you. What we're reading today is this book called Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness. It's by this dude named Itzhak Bentov. Now, what's really cool about this book, the history of this book. Now, if you Google out there CIA Gateway Program, you'll find a PDF that was unclassified several years ago or more recently. I'm not sure that details the CIA's look into consciousness and the powers of consciousness, stuff like telepathy, remote viewing. Basically, they found out it's real and there are methods of way, there are ways to access a higher consciousness through an altered state of consciousness to be able to do these things. And that, their program was based on this guy's book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness. What we're learning about right now as you as you enter uh, the stream is the nature of sound and vibrations. So before we get to learn about the crazy wild stuff like telekinesis and all that stuff and how it might work and be structured in our actual consciousness, we have to learn about the laws, the basic laws of nature. And we're starting with sound. So that's where we're at. We just learned about how everything produces a sound wave even when I move my hand like this. It's producing waves of sound that stretch out into the universe that are traveling at 740 miles per hour. So pretty cool stuff. So we're just learning about everything creates sound down to the smallest to the biggest thing. We're learning about an experiment right now, which is kind of a, a different way to create sounds. So we take, we've taken a wire and we connect both of its ends to a battery through a switch. Then we close the switch, making it a circle. Closing the switch just means taking that wire to the battery, it's like a loop. There's nothing else can really come in. We were told in school that three things happen. One, electrical current will run from one side of the battery to the other. Two, a magnetic, sorry, a magnetic field perpendicular to that current will shoot out and expand all the way to infinity. Yeah, heck yeah, I'll still be here. Enjoy the gym. Have a great time. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here still in an hour for sure. We might be gaming by then. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely still be here. <clears throat> Two, that a magnetic field perpendicular to that current will shoot out and expand all the way to infinity at the velocity of light, which is about 186,000 miles per second. And three, the wire will heat up slightly. They probably did not tell us that four that when the wire heats up, it expands, and by doing so, it will clearly force the air out of its way to make a kind of sound. Or five, that the mass of the wire is accelerated in this way. It will produce a gravitational waves, since any time a mass is accelerated, it will be broadcast, it will broadcast gravitational waves, which will again expand into infinity at the velocity of light. So I'm gonna show you guys that experiment here. But yeah, yo, Stereo, I'll be on here at least until 9.30 ish or 10, I'm thinking today. But I really appreciate that affiliate anniversary. When I saw it, I was like, ooh, I wonder if anyone will come in and say happy anniversary. So I appreciate that. 
All right. But here's the experiment. So here's what he's talking about. Now, this is the thing that blows my mind. What I love is is infinity. I just love infinity. I love the concept of infinity. I love everything about it. Come on, here we go. Here's the experiment we just read about. Now, that's that is interesting because he is right. In school, we just learned that this creates a battery, that this creates a current, that electric current's running through there, and you could connect that wire to something and it would power it, right? It's interesting that what they they fail to go over in school how it's also creating sound and energy from this. Sound and energy is literally being creative and gravitational waves are being sent out by this wire. That that makes the whole experiment so much cooler than just, you know, lighting a light bulb. But, uh, you know. <clears throat> Some will say that the gravitational waves will certainly be almost infinitesimally weak, but that does not worry us as long as they are there. So our action of closing the switch has been broadcast, theoretically at least, to the outer limits of the atmosphere around the Earth due to the movement of the air and was broadcast all the way to the end of the universe by the expansion of the magnetic field around the wire and by the gravitational wave due to the wire's acceleration. The purpose of this example is to show how in principle, even our smallest, most insignificant actions will be broadcast far and wide and thus influence something or someone, whether that something or someone is aware of it or not. We are all connected. It reminds me, it's like the butterfly effect, the flapping of the wings affects us all. It sends out sound waves. A butterfly flapping its wings is sending out sound waves that are traveling at the speed of light and the encompass the whole earth. I mean, and everything is constantly moving and making noises. We're like just bing bonging off each other. It's so cool. I'm making a noise right now, and that wave's traveling, and someone is making a noise on the on the other side of the globe, and that wave's traveling. Eventually, those noises are going to interact, and that in that way, we are quantumly entangled. Oh, mwah, mwah, mwah. anywho, the purpose of this example is to show how, in principle, oh, we did that. Even our, but I'm going to read that again because this is important. The purpose of this example is to show how, in principle, even our smallest, most insignificant actions will be broadcast far and wide and thus influence something or someone, whether that something or someone is aware of it or not. We should look now at other effects of sound. If we stretch a string on a frame, then pluck the string in the middle of its length, we shall see the outline of the string, string in extreme positions of its movement. It's for, it forms two symmetrical arcs, as shown. So that, that's true. Like, just pluck a, when you pluck something or make something like a, it makes me think too of door stoppers. And you go, boom. And you can see it. And you see the door stopper in movement. You see all, all, all the different extreme places that it's at. <clears throat> but here, just so you get the picture in your mind's eye. This is what he's talking about right now. Plucking a string. Sending, and now I know, sending sound waves into infinity. See here, you pluck it in the middle. Then it kind of the arcs of it show up. Ooh, the arcs of it show up there, and that's it in action. So here's plucking it in the middle, and here's when you pluck it in two separate places. So let's learn about that. So that's figure 2A. Then in figure 2B, the string has a point in the middle at which the string is at rest, and the two more points at which it is attached to the frame. So here we go. So sorry. So this point in the middle is at rest, and then two points attached to the frame, and you pluck it still, sound produced. Such points of rest are called nodes. All of the other points of the string are vibrating up and down. When the nodes along the string appear stationary and fixed, while the rest of the string is vibrating, we call such behavior a standing wave. Suppose we now take a thin sheet of metal, clamp it to one edge so that it stays in a horizontal position, and spread some dry sand evenly over the sheet. Then take a violin bow and draw it over one of the free edges of the sheet until it emits a note. Very soon we shall see that the sand grains are collecting on the sheet in a symmetrical pattern. As we apply the bow at different points along the edge of the metal, we shall get different and quite beautiful patterns on the sheet. So I don't know if you've ever witnessed this before, but people making like art and patterns out of sound, it is true. You put sound on something and you make a certain frequency, it makes a certain pattern. I'll show you just the picture he has here, but really I suggest doing some of your research on your own and going, if you've never seen that phenomenon, going to check that out on the YouTubes or the goggles or the Googles, whatever you like to use, check that out because it is pretty cool. But here's what he's talking about. So that experiment, right? You take sand grains, you run the violin bow over it till it makes a 
a note and a pattern is formed. Pretty funky and cool patterns are formed too, showing that there's a pattern to all this. <laughs> the reason for this aggregation of sand grains is that we are setting up the so-called standing waves in the metal. These standing waves in the metal sheet are two-dimensional versions of the standing wave in the string. These standing waves have active areas that vibrate up and down and other areas or nodes that are... Oh, I gotta look up what this word even means. Sorry, folks, give me a second. I'm like, what? And then we'll, we'll start over. So we, we read it, so we learn it together. Cause I don't even know, I don't, even, I don't wanna try and pronounce it. <laughs> Quiescent in the state of acti inactivity or dormancy. Okay. So these standing waves have active areas that vibrate up and down and other areas that are quiescent and quiescent means not moving, right? Yes, in a state of inactivity or not moving, okay? The sand grains will move away from the vibrating areas and accumulate in the quiescent areas or non-moving areas. The sand grains like to be left in peace and they will go to the quiet, low energy places. This pattern in sand actually outlines for us the pattern of standing waves in the metal sheet. And you know, it also makes me think of humans, people, low energy quiet places are the more peaceful places to be it's funny that the sand it's i love putting it that way the sand wants to be unbothered the sand wants to move away from the sound so it moves to the quiet areas quiescent areas the standing waves automatically divide the length and the width of the plate into an integral number of half wave lengths it is only then that the standing wave can be sustained this is so by definition Standing waves cannot exist unless they divide their medium into an integral number of half waves. A standing wave having a fractional wavelength, wavelength cannot be sustained. I mean, that makes sense because we're talking about sand, sound waves expanded to infinity. Why would they ever be uh, why would they ever be fractional? Okay, let's take a look here. And just to kind of drive this home that the sand will be moving to the quieter places. Like if you had a sheet metal like this, right? And you kind of like had it curved a bit like that and you were playing the sounds. The sand there, as you can see, is in between there. So the sand moves no matter what. The sand is going to... Oh, God, zoom. Come on, get clear, baby. Oh, refusing to get clear right now. But a flex sheet of metal forms a standing wave made of five half waves and sand accumulates at the nodes or the point of rest. So that's always where the point of harmony is gonna be. We can also put, sorry. We can also put it another way. The dimensions of the plate are the factors that govern what is the size or wavelength of the standing wave. That can be sustained in the plate when a structure is in resonance, which means that it vibrates at a frequency that is natural to it and is most easily sustained by it, it implies the presence of a standing wave. Let us see if we can visualize this kind of behavior in three dimensions. If we could take a transparent box, figure five, I'll show you guys in a second, fill it with fluid and disperse particles in it with the same specific gravity as the fluid so that they stay dispersed in the fluid and do not sink to the bottom, then by vibrating the walls of this box from all six sides in a synchronous manner, we could cause these particles to aggregate in a symmetrical three-dimensional pattern. This pattern will look just like a highly enlarged crystal. That sounds like he's making a hologram right there, but I'll show you right here. So here's what he's talking about. So having a three-dimensional standing wave in fluid. So we have putting particles in the fluid, right? So it's kind of a, it's a fluid that these particles can uh, form things in or sit freely come on zoom in baby zoom in baby they're gonna do it there we go so it's gonna uh this is the experiment we're talking about so imagine a 3d box and those little dots represent the particles inside and when you shake this box up because it is filled with standing wave fluid so think that means like a, a thicker fluid that things could like stand or sit still in when you shake it like that or you create these sound vibrations 
the particles inside are going to form shapes, symmetrical shapes, trying to get to the harmony, get away from the chaos. At the same time, we have produced a three-dimensional object analogous to the basic building block in nature, a highly ordered crystal. And we have done this simply by applying sound to an amorphous disorganized suspension of particles. In the box we have set up an interface, sorry, in the box we have set up an interference pattern of standing waves, which we will soon explain, that governs the positions of its particles. In short, by using sound, we have introduced others we, sorry, we had introduced order where previously there was none. It may occur to us that a crystalline structure may be seen as representing sound interacting in volume. It is possible that the orderly pattern of atoms, atoms and matter is the result of the interaction of some kind of sound waves in matter. Sorry, let me see. Let me do that again. Is it possible that the orderly pattern of atoms and matter is the result of the interaction of some kind of sound waves in matter? Now, superposed sound. So there we go. We've got, we have the basic, we just went over the basic structure of sound. And the main point of that section was knowing that when we do have sound and we do experiments on grains of sand, that material items, when encountered with sound waves, form shapes. From chaos, sound creates order. Now let us go one step beyond and see whether sound can also be used for storing information or knowledge. A shallow round pan and three pebbles, sorry. Yeah, no, that's it. A shallow round pan and three pebbles are all we need for this experiment. Fill the pan with water. Now drop three pe pebbles in simultaneously as shown in figure six and watch the ripples spread. So as we was talking about, we put them in, you put, you drop the three pebbles in, you could see their ripples that are going across, in, that are not only rippling, whoop, that are not only rippling in the pan, come on, zoom in, but also sending those sound waves throughout the universe. So that's our first step, boom, you do that in the pan. Then in the pan, each pebble is a source of waves spreading evenly across the pan. Let us neglect the wave, let us neglect the wavelets that reflected back from the walls of the pan. These waves cross each other and create quite co a quite complex pattern of wavelets on the surface of the water. They look pretty chaotic to us. There is, however, an order in this apparent chaos. All that has happened is that the wave produced by each individual pebble expanded and reached the edge of the pan. In so doing, the waves have crossed and interfaced, interacted with each other on the way to the edges of the pan. This interaction created a complex pattern that is called an interference pattern. If we carefully analyze this pattern, however, we can trace back e each wavelet to its source, the pebble. Let us now quick freeze the surface of the water of the pan and lift out the, res the resulting rippled sheet of ice. If we are holding in our hands, we are holding in our hands a record of the interference pattern of waves, or we may even call it a hologram. And holograms factor heavily into this section, like the rest of the kind of idea of consciousness as well. I'll show you just the ice sheet again. So that's the experiment, right? So this, oh, come on. Give it to me, baby. Come on, zoom in. How close do you want me? Anyway, the camera's being a butt, but you can see here, that's the pan of water. You drop the three pebbles in, it creates those sound waves. They bounce off each other and they create interference patterns and they go to the edge of the pan as well. Now you quick freeze that and what you have is a record. You have information. Sound can store information, can store patterns. It also rocks my world thinking about it, that experiment because we're just living in a world that's sound things are just bouncing off. Interference patterns are going on everywhere all the time. It's so crazy to think about it that way. Interference patterns and beat frequencies. In order to clarify what an interference pattern is, we have to learn about two additional properties of sound in its different forms. One, constructive and deconstructive inter interference, and two, beat frequencies. Let us take the first one in figure 7a. You will see what happens when two wave patterns of identical frequency and amplitude or wavelength meet. 
Let's try to superimpose them onto each other. In figure 7a, we see that the hills and valleys of the frequencies in rows a and b match each other. If we superimpose them by measuring their heights and amplitudes from their respective baselines, then we find that the hill matches hill and valley matches valley. Basically, he's talking about just two sound waves that match up with each other. They're at the same frequency. This is what he's talking about. Yeah, so when the hills and valleys match, we find that they reinforce each other. So this is sound that reinforces each other. So when two frequencies are the, pretty much the same, gosh, why aren't you zooming in anymore? But anyways, when two frequencies are pretty much the same, come on, baby, come on. I'm just gonna hold it to the Nope, not doing, back. Anywho, you don't, the words, whatever. But you can see here, those two sound frequencies right here, they're the, they're the same. Then when you combine them, they be, it becomes bigger. So you got A and B. You combine those when they're the same, but you become C. So you get a more, more sound. You get a bigger sound when two frequencies match up like that. Okay, so, and when added up, they produce a waveform twice the height of the original waveforms as shown in row C. That's what we just looked at. This is known as constructive interference because it builds up the amplitude. If we now look at figure 7b, right? We're gonna look at figure 7b and things won't match up. When things don't match up, so in the other figure, the hills match the hills, the valleys match the valleys. You're gonna see in this one that when they don't match up, it boop, turns into a flat line. And I'll show you that in a second. Let's read about it first. If we now look at figure 7b, we find that hills match valleys. Sorry, that hill, that hills match valleys and valleys match hills. And if we add them up, we shall find that they cancel each other out as the flat line in row C indicates. This is known as destructive interference. This is what is happening in our pan of water. If we look at the ripples in the ice sheet, we shall find that where the hill meets hill, we end up with a hill double the original wave height. And where hill meets valley, we find just a flat spot. This is the nature of an interference pattern. However, many forms of interference patterns are possible. We may have them in a single dimension, as when we vibrate a string, or in two dimensions, as in our flat pan, or in three dimensions, as in our box in figure five. And here is an example of what it means when you get that just, uh, when you get that disturbance. So when hills match, hills and valleys match valleys in sound waves, you get big time. You get bigger peaks and valleys. When they don't match each other, you get flat line. Whoop, 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 whoop. You get flat line, as you can see there. A and B above it. I'm sorry, it's blurry. My camera's not zooming today, which is a bummer. A and B up there are not matching each other, so then they become C, which is a flat line. Hey, there we go. Then you become C, which is a flat line. So A and B, C, they're not matching, like on the previous page, and then they become a flat line. But when they do match, now that it's zoomed in, I want to show you guys again. When they do match, it becomes big boy, a big boy sound. So interesting how sound waves interact like that. Now let's move on to beat frequencies. We love a good beat. Okay. Now that we know what an interference pattern is, it will be relatively easy to understand a beat frequency. In figure 7C, we see a frequency in a row. Let's say it's 50 cycles per second and a frequency in row B, let's say it's 60 cycles per second. If we add them up as we did before, we shall discover an interesting phenomenon. Row C shows the results of adding, two, adding the two frequencies. What we see is a pearl shaped wave form superimposed on top of our A and B waveforms. The reason for this becomes obvious if we examine figure 7C carefully. We'll show you figure 7C after we go over it. Starting from the left, we see that in row C, the amplitude or wave height is low where the hills and valleys oppose each other and high where both waveforms coincide or reinforce each other, which results in a constructive interference. The wave patterns are said then to be in phase, to use a technical term. Now, as we move to the right, we notice that the A and B waves gradually go out of phase and the hills start facing the valleys, thus opposing each other, which means that a destructive interference is occurring. This destructive interference reaches its maximum in every fifth cycle, forming a narrow waist. The amplitude or volume of the sound at those points, 
The pearly pattern in row C will therefore be a modulation of the basic sound, which has a fixed amplitude. Modulation means a change that is being caused in an otherwise smooth or even behavior. In our case, it means an increase and decrease of the amplitude or volume. So let's take a look at that. So basically he's explaining how beats work. So when you have a frequency that matches up at first, and but then at the end they stop matching up, you get a beat and you get turns kind of pearl shaped. Let's, I'll show you guys what that is. You get some music. We're learning how music is created. So I'm gonna wait till the zoom's perfect. So if you see there, looking at C, A and B, right? Those are the two frequencies that combine to make the beat. And if you see at first they, they match up, then a little later down the line, oops, then a little, oh, come on. Okay. Then a little later down, so A and B, you can see they match up, right? Then a little day later down the line on there, they start not matching up. The peaks and valleys don't match up. So since it's not, now if it was a total unmatching, we'd get a flat line. But since it is resonant for a little while, as in the peaks and valleys match up, we get a pearl shape there. And you can see in the bottom on C there, it goes a half circle, then it meets at a point. That's the node where it's the peaceful place. So if we look at that, that's a, that's a beat in creation. So when it's two, oh, hold on here. Sorry, I gotta log back in. So that's how you create a beat. When two sound waves line up for a bit and then they don't line up anymore, it creates a beat. Okay. This modulation will occur 10 times per second with a minima occurring every six cycles. This is 10 Hertz. Modulation is called a beat frequency and is the difference between an A and B frequencies or 60 Hertz minus 50 Hertz equals 10 Hertz. Were we to make a 10 cycles per second sound, wait, A, sorry. If we were to make A 10 cycles per per second sound and B a 12 cycles per second sound, we would then have a 12 minus 10 or two cycle per second beat frequency superimposed on these two basic frequencies. The knowledge of these two properties of sound will be important toward the end of this book. Note that the difference between the two fast frequencies produces a third frequency that is much slower than the first two. This then is a beautiful device for converting high frequencies to low ones. And those low frequencies are what is peaceful. All right. Excellent. Let's keep trucking. All right. Hmm. I do want to try this. We do have a bit of ways to go, but I'm kind of itching to get into a video game. But let's keep going with this for now. Nature's information storage. Let's go back now to the sheet of ice we lifted from the pan to find a proper light source to illuminate it. We shall find, to our great surprise, that we can see the three pebbles suspended in midair if we look through the ice towards the light. He means you see the three hologram of the pebbles. They will look very three-dimensional to us. This is, totally un this is a totally unexpected result. It seems that the rippled surface of the ice or the interference patterns has somehow stored the information about the whereabouts and the shape of the pebbles. The ice surface acted as a distorted lens in such a way as to focus the light to the points taken up by the pebbles that have caused all these ripples. The chaotic looking ice surface is actually an information storage device, like a hologram. You know, you look at hologram in certain ways, you don't see the information you're supposed to see. But when you put it in the right light, you see the 3D image. Suppose now that due to a monetary gap in attention, sorry, Suppose now that due to a momentary gap in attention, our plain or plain clumsiness, this ice sheet this ice sheet slips out of our hands and drops on the floor and breaks. We sadly collect the pieces, but before throwing them all out, we hold up one of them and illuminate in the same way we did the larger sheet. To our great surprise, we find that the three pebbles again are projected midair in the figure. But how come? And I'll show you what he's talking about just in the picture. So even in the smaller pieces, so this information is stored in every single piece of the hologram. It's like when you zoom in on a hologram, you see, well, no matter what part you zoom in on, it's just you see a bunch of tiny ones. It's a bunch of tiny big pictures of, the, of what you're looking at. Sound holds information. 
holograms are created makes you think about our reality okay so let me uh go here so this is what he's talking about so see how the light this is what we just learned about in this figure i'm gonna go come on baby yes so you got coherent light going through there and because of the way the light hits and it hits all the angles of the ripples it creates those three pebbles you see on the bottom right so that's the image of the pebbles where the light's coming through now the same thing happens with the now you have next to it that's a shard of ice the same thing happens with the coherent light that comes through it hits it at the right angles and it shows you the three pebbles again because there are still waves stored in that little piece of ice waves had that hold the information of the shape of each pebble so that's how that hologram is created bloop, bloop. you may remember that the information about the whereabouts of each pebble was carried by the waves moving to the edge of the pan we know if we drop just a single pebble into the pan it would be easy for us to locate we would simply seek out the center or constrict concentric waves or rings or wave fronts we know also that the waves from each pebble cross the face of the whole pan. Naturally, they must have interacted with each other across the whole surface of the pan on every square centimeter of its surface. We can show it like this. The arcs created by each pebble are crossing a small piece of the surface and each arc can be traced back to its origin. This is the basic principle of the hologram. However, I would not recommend that you actually try to perform the experiment just described. It will not work in practice for certain com complicated technical reasons. Yeah, I don't think we could flash freeze anything, which shall by which we shall bypass. But it is perfectly useful for the purposes of explaining the workings of the most exciting information, of the most exciting information storage device, the hologram. It is nature's way of storing information. It's like I feel like he's leading us. Like Nate, we are a projection of consciousness. So it's like. It already makes me think, and I'm already going off the rails here. I'm going off the, the beaten path of our book. It makes me think of people, you know, the um, simulation theory, being plugged in, matrix, all that stuff. For me, it's, I believe it's somewhere in the area of, yes, it's a simulation, but not one as we think. It's more like a hologram, like it's being described here. We are the projection of the universal mind, the universal consciousness. Uh, we're holograms of it and we contain information of nature. I don't know. But let's keep reading. Storage device. The hologram. It is nature's way of storing information. There is already evidence that our brains store information in a holographic form. This kind of storage device is the most compact known to nature. An example of this is the genetic code carried in our chromosomes. Each cell in our bodies carries all the information required to make an additional copy of our bodies. And just a picture of chromosomes, if you need, real quick. These are the chromosomes. This is what composes us. These are the little cells, the chromosomes. All of our bodies have enough information to make a copy of ourselves. Isn't that wild? We can make an additional copy of ourselves. I mean, that that just that makes sense as far as like the human body healing and stuff. But we have the material to do it. Oh, whoa! Zoomed in on my guy. Hey, it's actually not bad. But we'll go back. You need to see the water a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Our success in storing information in the system just described depends naturally on the predictable and orderly behavior of the waves in the pan. They must be consistent both in velocity and in distance between the waves or wavelengths. This is what makes them reliable as carriers of information. Otherwise, all we would get is a hodgepodge of waves. Here is where the coherency comes in. Now let's learn about coherency. Coherency. It would be good at this point to describe the way a real hologram is made so you become familiar with this important concept. So let's let's dig into how holograms are made. I've never known. I've always it's always seemed just like magic, right? But let's dig in. Are hologram performances still a big thing? Do people still like that? I remember I was at the Coachella where hologram Tupac performed. It's pretty cool. It would be good at this point, but, but hologram. So here we go. Here's just an example. I'm going to show you this figure because we're going to start talking about it. But this is basically how it could be formed, right? Because information, you'll see the white light or information entering. So you'll this will make sense as we read. But you have one light entering from one direction, then it exits the prism, 
with all these beautiful colors, kind of creating like a hologram almost. Because what that what the prism does is it breaks down the light. Because the white light goes in, we can't see all the beautiful colors that are within that that light, right? So that goes into the prism, then it's refracted, and because it's sent out in different angles, it comes out as beautiful colors. So essentially, that's like a, a mini mini hologram there. Because you we're, we are, I'm calling it a mini hologram because we are seeing the information that is within the light that's normally hidden from us thanks to a crystal prism, right? Information where it's stored. Okay. By coherency, we mean an order of a certain kind. In this case, we shall talk about coherent light without which a good hologram cannot be made. The most popular source of coherent light is the laser. The first important aspect of a laser light is that it produces light of a single frequency. We all know that our sun sends light that can be broken down by a prism into a spectrum containing all the colors of the rainbow, what we just looked at. A laser produces a light that is just a single color from that rainbow, which we will call monochromatic light. In addition, the light emitted by the laser is coherent or goes in step. By that we mean that all the light coming out of the source is moving forward, even in even flat fronts. This makes it impossible for the laser light to stay in a narrow beam over a very large distance. Okay, so slowly the laser will spread out. The light will spread out, but very slowly. I'll show you guys an example. Here's figure 10. Here's what a laser looks like. So as you can see, it's one wavelength. One straight wavelength, right? And if we look back at the sunlight, the white light from the sun, it's many wavelengths that create... Oh, come on, don't... Yes, it's many wavelengths that create a spectrum of colors there, right? And they're not just all going one direction. It's spread out. Okay. Beep, 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 beep. All right. There is a better way to describe coherency. Suppose we have a parade and a company of soldiers marching in military fashion down a main street. They are moving along 10 abreast, very carefully aligned in each row. The distance between the rows are fixed, which is analogous to the even distances between the crests of light waves that they are carefully aligned abreast and they are carefully aligned, none of them sticking out of line, is analogous to the light being in phase or in step. In short, the roar, of, roar <laughs> in short, the row of soldiers is analogous to the light emitted by the laser beam. Suppose now that a slip up occurs and one of the soldiers not watching his fellows, his fellows shifts out of his row and moves forward and steps on the heel of a fellow in front of him. The latter panics, thinking that he is lagging behind, and he jumps forward and bumps into the fellow ahead of him. Now this starts a general panic in which soldiers bumping into each other disrupt the nice even width of the moving column. The neat column diverges, broadens, and then opens up completely in great disorder in spite of the fact that their commander is blowing his whistle and tearing at his hair and using strong language to get his men back into line. What we have learned from this disastrous parade is that the beam of light can stay in a narrow beam similar to the laser's beam only as long as it is coherent. When coherency is lost, the beam will tend to expand rapidly, just as will the beam of a regular flashlight. So that's when it loses coherency. And let's take a look. I'll just show you because that is that's a really good um, analogy for it. If we look here, that's the parade he was talking about. So laser light is a lot like that parade. Come on, baby, zoom in. But you can see it starts off orderly in the back. Whoop. Starts off, whoop. Starts off orderly back here. Oh, come on. There we go. Starts off orderly back here. Then as that soldier messes up, it gets disorderly and we're put into chaos. So that's the same kind of deal with the laser light. It travels and travels and travels in a perfectly straight, coherent form until its coherency is interrupted by something. Whether it be distance or an object. Now let's get into the hologram. So we learned about the laser, how it shoots and spreads eventually. We have seen before that information can be stored in an interface pattern of waves. To have interference, we must have at least two interacting components. 
and here is how it's done in figure 11. So this is how you make a hologram. They're made with lasers. They basically have to create an interacting, sorry, they have to create an interference to create a hologram. Because basically what we'll learn now, the too long didn't read, holograms get the information, it splits, then when the lasers meet back up, one laser shares its information with the other laser, and then when you look at that beam of light in a certain way, you see the holographic information. When the light hits, just like with the pebble, when you're holding a, the object up where the information is kept and the light hits it, you see the holographic information. And here is the figure of how, kind of a crude little figure here on how it's done in figure 11. We have the laser, you have a half mirror. Oh. Okay, so this is basically how a hologram is gonna work and this is what we're gonna explain today. So if you see, here we have a tomato, here we have the laser, the laser right here, shoots out, hits a photographic plate that goes down and hits the tomato. Then that bounces off here and hits the mirror. And then the mi mirror hits the lint. Then that it bounces the so so laser shoots out. Boom. Hits a photographic lens. Boom. Hits a tomato. Boom. Hits over here to the mirror, right? Then the mirror bounces it off through a lens. Then the lens shoots it out and we get the holographic image. That's a hologram in a nutshell, just from a basic figure. We're going to go through that. So it shoots up in another mirror and that shoots up back to the half mirror and we get holographic image right there. So let's go. The laser light beam is split into two components by a half mirror. That is a semi-transparent mirror that allows part of the beam to continue undisturbed while part is deflected into another mirror. Both narrow beams are spread over by lint open by lenses. The upper beam, which we shall call the reference beam, that was the first beam we saw, so that's the first beam, right? Arrives at the photographic plate after an eventless flight. Since no event of note has occurred on its way to the plate, it proceeds then to deposit its imprint on the film. The other half of the beam, we shall call the working beam, is the beams, this beam's trip had an event. It had an encounter on its way, an object. In the, our case, oh sorry, it was an apple, not a tomato. So that was an apple in the figure that had that it had illuminated and with which it had interacted. We don't consider it encounters through mirrors and lenses as worthwhile talking about. The working beam will then be reflected from the apple and fall on the film. There it will meet its twin, the reference beam, and it will tell it all about its experience with the apple. The, inter the interaction between the two beams will cause ripples to form between them, which will form the interference pattern we already are familiar with, since the light waves will behave in this case the same way as do water waves. However, these ripples do not at all resemble the shape of the apple. But as we already know, the ripples in the photographic emulsion do contain information. And that information can be elicited from the film by illuminating the exposed, the exposed film to the same light used in making the hologram. As we do that, we shall see the apple appear suspended in midair and looking very three-dimensional and real. We could be easily deceived when viewing an image reconstructed from a hologram that we are seeing an actual object. So there we go. I'm going to show you that again so we can explain that better now that we learned about it. So this that is how a hologram is created. The laser leaves its home. Oh, come on, baby. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get this so you guys can see. Whoop. So the laser leaves its home right there. If you see on the top, it hits the half mirror and then it's split, right? It's split. And then one laser goes down. That laser that goes down has no events. It goes to the mirror. It hits the reflecting mirror. Then it goes down. It goes through the lens and hits the mirror. The other laser, which goes through the half lens and the lens, that has an event. It hits the photographic plate, then hits the apple. Then you could see when these two lasers meet up again, boom, hologram of the apple. So you see the laser starts out, one laser goes through here, no events and ends up on the holographic plate. The other laser, boom, it's the same laser, but when it splits, it hits this half mirror, drops down, hits another mirror, goes through the lens, hits this mirror, bounces off, finally hits the apple, and then it meets back up with its twin and they share the information and we get a hologram. Pretty cool. 
Note that the important part of holographic image making is the interaction of a reference beam, a beam that is a pure virgin and untouched, with a working beam, which has some experiences in this life. The magnitude of these experiences is being measured against the reference beam, which serves as a baseline for comparison. Our whole reality is constructed by constantly making such comparisons. Our senses, which describe our reality to us, are making these comparisons all the time. Unfortunately, our senses, having no absolute reference line, must generate their own relative reference line. But whenever we perceive something, we always perceive the differences only. And here's, okay, so this is what a hologram looks like, just straight up when we're not looking at it through coherent light. So when you don't have a light source to shine on the hologram, it looks very distorted. So this is the hologram of the apple that we just learned about. Without coherent light, come on, there we go. Without coherent light, as you can see on the picture there, and the, the square, just the square, it's just nothing. But when you look on the other side here, whoops, when you look here, when you look here, you see that when you have a coherent light source and it shines through the mirror or the glass or the crystal where the hog, where the two lasers shared information, you get boom, the apple. And that's how, that's what you see when you see a hologram. Well, that's what you're witnessing. That is the magic and the power of a hologram when you buy one or, you know, those little like, you know what I'm talking about? Those like cubes that have holograms in them. It would be useful to take one example from nature to see how such differences are put to use in a very obvious way. Take the bat, for instance. We all know that this little mouse-like fellow lives on insects he catches in flight. Since he is active at night, he has developed a sonar-like device that serves him very well and enables him to make a reasonably easy living. He has a highly specialized structures in his head that allow him to emit very high frequency sound and to direct in a fairly narrow beam. This is his reference beam. As this beam encounters a flying insect, whoa, dude, is he saying, dude, that bats create mental holograms? Anyway, this is his reference beam. As this beam encounters a flying insect, some of the sound will be reflected bats back to the bat. Figure 12, we'll show you that in a second. He picks up the echo, or, we, or as we can call it, the working beam, and compares it to his original squeaker chirp. There will be a difference between the two called the Doppler effect. And this difference tells the bat how far away the insect is, how fast it's flying, and re relative to him. As the bat successfully closes in on the insect, the differences between the two frequencies, the emitted frequency and the echo, diminishes. When it becomes very small, the bat opens its mouth and swallows the echo. Some echoes, as the bat surely knows, are tastier than others. And I'm going to show you a picture of that, but it's just so... I mean, I've never... It, you know, we all know that, like, bats like you sonar or whatever, we have that idea, but you never really picture how it works. It's so interesting to imagine a bat, because all I'm thinking about is imagine it's like flying around blind and it's just going on sound and then knowing that when the sound stops, the bug is like almost in your mouth, so you gotta go and chomp it. That's so wild to me. But anywho, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. And it, it, we have the experiment with the nodes too, right? So you can see the bat sends his sound wave of information out, his eek, his squeak. Come on, baby, get good. Come on now. There we go. So you can see the bat there and fig uh, sends his little squeak out, and it goes out in waves. And you could, I don't know, you could see that, but there's those little waves cutting. There's a little bug that it hit. There's little waves that bounce back, and those are waves of information that all contains information. It's not just sound. That's information that goes out there, and it hits the bug, and it comes back, and the bat knows exactly where it is and when to open its mouth and chomp on down. We see now by appreciating the difference between two sounds or vibrations, one can get along quite well in life. There are many creatures that make a living by appreciating differences in sound, porpoises, whales, and many others. We humans also utilize this technique in less obvious ways in color, vision, hearing, in, col in, col in color, vision, in hearing, and etc. Excellent. So that's kind of how a hologram works and how sound can help create a hologram and how sound holds information. Now, continuing here, we're going to make it to the end of this chapter, then we'll wrap everything up. Then we'll get to gaming. Oscillators and resonant systems. We may describe an oscillator as an object that moves in a regular periodic manner. We may call a vibrating string an oscillator. 
or a weight hanging from a spring or a pendulum. Anything that performs Anything that performs a repetitive periodic movement that is that is vibrates, we may generalize and say that oscillators produce a sound or a note, whether audible or not. As long as they alter their environment in a periodic manner, that environment may be tissue, as in the heart aorta oscillating system. Oscillating system oscillators. Well, let me sorry, let me start over here. We may generalize and say that oscillators produce a sound or a note, whether audible or not. As long as they alter their environment in a periodic manner, the environment may be tissue, like human flesh, as in the heart aorta oscillating system, water, air, electrical fields, gravitational fields, or anything else. Oscillators. So, and here's just an example. So anything that vibrates and moves and performs repetition. Remember, when we're talking about oscillators, we're talking about repetition. So that's the important thing. Like our hearts are one. And you can see there two oscillators got a swing. We got a pendulum on a spring there or a ball on a string performing the perpetual motion, right? Oscillator. Isn't that nice? <clears throat> Suppose we tune two violins and then put one of them on the table and play a note and play a note on the other. If we watch carefully, oh no, I love this. So we're gonna read this again. Suppose you have two violins then put one of them on the table and play a note on the other. If we watch carefully, we shall see that the same string we are playing on one violin is also humming on the violin that we placed on the table. Clearly, there is a sympathetic resonance between the two. Let us analyze what is happening. 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 When we draw the bow over a string, it vibrates at its own natural frequency, which we call self frequency. Since the two violins are correctly tuned, we know that the natural frequencies are both of both strings were identical. Within a system like this, we shall call the two violins a system. It is very easy to transfer energy. In this case, we are talking about acoustical energy. The airwaves generated by the first violin impinge on the second violin. The string that is tuned to the emitted note will absorb the energy of the waves of that frequency preferentially because that energy comes to it at its own natural frequency. The energy transfer within the system is therefore optimum, and such a system made up of two tuned oscillators is called a resonant system. Okay, so that's looking at the resonant system as far as like just a good example of whoop, 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 All right, so this is what we're talking about. This is basically what we just read, just in picture form. Come on, baby, zoom in. You can see even without it zooming in too much, but the, vi the violin's playing. It's sending its sound waves out. It hits the violin on the table. And since they're both tuned exactly the same way, that string, that frequency, hits just that string and frequency on the violin. You notice the sound wave's not making all the strings on the violin play. It's just making its, its uh, it's sibling twin, it's twin frequency string, Bing, just a little bit. But let's take a look at another example. This is also, a, this is another example that rocks my world. Let us take another example. Suppose we get several old fashioned pendulum style grandfather clocks. Let us hang them on a wall and arrange their pendulums so that they will start out beating each at a different angle. So like they're all the pendulums and a grandfather clock, you know, grandfather clock, if you are those big clocks that have like, you know, the pendulums that swing, I'll show you guys. It's a crude drawing, but I'll show you in a second. So you start them all out, all swinging differently. They're not aligned at all. They're all at different angles. Each beating at a different angle that is out of phase with each other. In a day or two, we shall find that all the pendulums are beating in phase as if locked together. Pendulum length should be the same for all of them. Here we see that the tiny amount of energy that was transmitted through the wall, sorry, that was transmitted through the wall from the clock to the clock. Sorry. Here we see that the tiny amount of energy that was transmitted through the wall from clock to clock was sufficient to bring them into a phase with each other. If we disturb one of the clocks, it will get locked into the rhythm quite fast. The larger the number of oscillators within such a system, the more stable the system and the more difficult it is to disturb it. 
it will force a wayward oscillator back into line very quickly. So, I mean, that's, I mean, it just shows the universe likes harmony, likes patterns. So if you have a, I'll show you, I'll show you the, the sketch here. So here's the sketch. Here's the sketchers, sketchers, sketchers. Come on, baby. Get in with me. Zoom in. There you go. So those are the wall clocks. You imagine, so you know what I'm talking about now, the clocks that have the pendulums that swing. So if you, what, what we just read is saying that if you have set two and they're both swinging differently like this, in a matter of time, they'll start swinging like this together and no, and no time at all. And the more things you have swinging, the harder it is to get them out of lockstep. Even if you set them off at vastly different angles and they're going like this, they're going to end up all together, all together in a beautiful rhythm. Now let's talk about the sound of the body, because that's right. Me blinking my eyes right now. I'm creating sound waves. I'm sending them out into space. They're traveling at 740 miles per hour. Uh, okay, so the sound of the body. The heart is a big noise maker. We can easily check this by putting our ear on someone's chest and listening to it. That also makes me think like, you know, if we could sense these sound waves on a deep subconscious level, that's why we can get weird feelings. If so, we know if someone's like looking calm, but maybe their heart's racing really fast or really nervous, we kind of feel that we can kind of feel that out sometimes. Each beat shakes the whole body, Whoa. and the body has a typical response to this beat, which is quite easily measured. Figure 13, which we'll get to, shows what such motion looks like when measured with a sensitive seismographic instrument. This movement is clearly related to the heartbeat. In fact, the largest peak we see in this graph is caused by the ejection of blood from the heart's left ventricle. The, po the, the portion between the large peaks looks fairly irregular, and is caused by the vibration of the body due to the action of the blood in the aorta, which is the largest artery in our body. This irregular portion is due to the destructive interference pattern set up in the aorta, which is shown later. So just interesting, right? We're gonna get into what we just learned about, how our heart and body creates a beat. It's not just a sound that goes together. It's not necessarily like this, it's a beat. It goes together for a little bit, stops goes together for a little bit in a rhythm in a pattern and just so if you all aren't familiar i'm going to show you a diagram of the heart so you know where the left ventricle is so the left ventricle that's what mainly pumps mo that's what pumps most of our blood or all of our blood in our body you can see here left ventricle pumps it out through the aorta which is our major major vein that uh, supplies our body with blood and that's just the diagram of our hearts When we stop breathing, the irregular signal in figure 13 turns into a nice regular, practically sine wave pattern in figure 14. So that's what's interesting. When we stop breathing, we actually go into a more harmonious state. So look at figure 13 here. That's the top one. I'll, I'll wait till it zooms in. Come on, baby. Come on now. Give me the zoom. Yes, okay, figure 13. So take a look at the top there. That is us beating, that's our pulse. Boom, 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 like a heart. When we stop breathing, the heart slows down, almost stops, and it's more just like boom, 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 boom. A smooth, even rhythm. Here's what seems to be the case. When the left ventricle of the heart ejects blood, the, the aorta, being elastic, balloons out just beyond the valve and causes a pressure pulse to travel down the aorta, so on through our bodies. When the pressure pulse reaches the bifurcation in the lower abdomen, which is where the aorta forks into two and goes into the legs, part of the pressure pulse rebounds and starts traveling up the, the aorta. Just like we saw with the bat, right? When you send out a signal, if it hits a, a point, it's gonna bounce back. So when our hearts send our blood up, send our blood through the body and it get, reaches to the point of the aorta where it splits into the legs or travels down, that's when it hits a point and that's when it sends a sound vibration back up. Part of the pressure pulse rebounds and starts traveling up the aorta. If in the meantime, the heart ejects more blood and new pressure pulses traveling down, these two pressure fronts will eventually collide 
where the aorta with the aorta and produce an interference pattern. This is reflected in the movement of the body and is the reason for the irregular pattern of body motion in figure 13. So I'll show you that again. So this is why this dead zone right here where it goes, it's like whoop, on figure 13, this is us. This is the, these are the sound waves our heart makes. This is our sound waves of our body. The dead zone you see in between on the, this top one, boom, boom. Then it stops down there. That's when the sound wave from the aorta and the new sound wave from the heart are colliding. And that's where we get that kind of pause. Just interesting stuff. And I'll show you here, this is an example. I'll just show you what I just described in diagram form here. This is an example of that. That's the heart here at the top. It pumps the blood down. It gets here to the, the point where the aorta forks. Come on, baby, zoom in. And then when it gets to the point where the aorta forks, it shoots the back up and then the sound waves hit each other kind of here in the middle. But that's a rough diagram. Sorry that I didn't zoom in, but that's called bifurcation. However, when the breathing stops, it looks as if some communication has been set up between the heart and the bifurification. Some kind of signal seems to travel from the bifurification to the heart saying, heart, hold it. Hold your next pulse until the echo of bifurification returns to you. Only, when, only then should you eject the next quantity of blood. When this happens, the echo and pulse move out of the heart together, and they continue to move up and down in, synchron in synchronicity. Then such a system is said to be in resonance. It causes the body to move harmoniously up and down without about seven times a second. Hence, the nice, regular, large amplitude sine wave pattern in figure 14. That's when you're holding your breath. The amplitude or height of this signal is about three times the average of the normal signal. Other characteristics of resonant behavior is that it requires for its sustenance a minimum amount of energy. Well, but how long can we hold our breath? Certainly not over a minute or so comfortably. And so we start breathing and ruin the nice rhythmic pattern. Let us not forget now that our body includes our head and inside the skull, a caref carefully packaged is a very delicate instrument, the brain. The brain is cushioned by a thin layer of fluid and wrapped in a tight bag of dura. About the simplest way to visualize this system is to have a relatively soft round fruit, such as a peach enclosed in a can containing a heavy syrup. If we shake the can, we find that the peach will hit the top and bottom of the can and be accelerated with a small delay in the direction in which the can is moving. This movement is quite small, only 0.5 or 0 0.010 millimeters. This is exactly what happens to the brain. So basically, we, when we shake our heads around too much, careful, Tommy. When you shake your head around too much, it, your, your brain bounces around. It's going to get a little bruise. And that bruise is going in the direction of how you hit your head. If that makes sense. So if you slam your head, boom, back like this, and you get boom. So then the force from what you hit your head on is coming this way. The bruise on your brain spreads forward that way. So I'll show you here just, just so you guys get the... So just like this. So see, like that's a can of peaches right there. You shake that can of peaches up and down. Boom, boom, boom. It's hitting the top and bottom. You shake our brain up and down. Boom, boom, boom. It's hitting the top and bottom. Becoming bruised. The question is, how come we are not aware of this happening to us? It's probably because when something is happening to the nervous system for an extended period of time, and that event is not traumatic, it will not be brought to our conscious attention because the position of the brain that is in change, charge of censoring and separating meaningful signals from unmeaningful ones will relegate it to the heap of unimportant signals. Which require no conscious processing. We know from experience that we can easily get used to and disregard a loud ticking of a clock next to us or the noise of a cabin of the of the or the noise in the cabin of an airplane. The noise is however filled, sorry, the noise is however filed away somewhere and affects us in some subtle ways. 
if we were to ask the brain how it would like to be treated, whether shaken at random or irregular rate or in a rhythmic harmonious fashion, we can be sure the brain or for that matter, the whole body would prefer the latter. Yeah, the brain wants simple quiet. And I think that's what we're learning here in this section, right? Like even with this, the grains of sand, they the the grains of sand find where it's quietest, right? So our brain's the same way. We want to be in a low frequency, low low energy place with our brains, so it's not constantly being bombarded with movements and shakements and all that stuff. Okay, we got an ad's about to start. Unfortunately, bear with me now. I won't continue reading till we're back. Three, two, one, and we're back. All right, so <clears throat> now we're going to get into rhythm entertainment. Suppose we go out on a balmy summer evening and notice some fireflies settling in a bush, blinking off and on. At first, this blinking is random, but fairly soon we notice that an order is slowly developing. You ever notice this when order starts developing in front of you? After a while, we see that the fireflies in the whole bush are blinking on and off in unison. This phenomenon is called rhythm entertainment. It seems that nature finds it more economical in terms of energy to have periodic events that are close enough in frequency to occur in phase or in step with each other. That is the meaning of rhythm entertainment. So that in rhythm entertainment in nature, we're not talking about like bands, even though we are kind of as well, uh, is more nature likes rhythm. Nature likes things to be chilling. Nature likes things to be blinking together. It's easier to get in a resume a resonance of it's easier when you're in a resonance when you're in a, when you're in order right so that nature loves that stuff so that's when you're seeing that whenever you do encounter whether it's fire bugs or whatever you're around or you notice like things stop bl are blinking off and on at first start blinking together in unison that's nature that's the consciousness giving you some rhythm entertainment because it's easier that way let us take another example when electronic circuits are built so that they contain oscillators of electronic type type common in radio or TV circuits that happen to oscillate in frequencies that are close enough to each other, there will be a tendency of the oscillators to get locked in step with each other and oscillate at the frequency of one of them. Usually, it is the fastest oscillator that will force the slower ones to operate at its pace. Here again, nature feels that it is more economical if two or any number of oscillators that vibrate at frequencies close enough to each other work together rather than insist on keeping their small differences. Nature forces the small differences out, forces coherence and rhythm. Major effects of rhythm entertainment occur in nature. Our, bi our biological rhythms are entertained by light, and to a certain extent by gravitational effects. These are two of the most obvious factors. However, magnetic, electromagnetic, atmospheric, and subtle geophysical effects influence us, influence us in ways that are not presently well understood. We usually get up with daylight and go to sleep at night. The sleep-wake cycles of animals and birds are more strongly tied to the light-dark cycle than those of our civilized humanity. Because we have developed artificial sources of light and can change our light-dark cycle at will, However, we all know that when our light dark cycle, which runs our biological clocks is drastically altered as when we take a long jet flight in an east west direction and cross several time zones, such an interference with our biorhythm has quite a marked effect on our ability to function in the new environment for a day or two. An interesting experiment was performed by Professor Frank Brown Jr. of Northwestern University. 
in Evanston, Illinois. In order to check out what factors influence the biorhythm of animals, he had some live oysters shipped to his lab from Long Island, a distance of about a thousand miles in an east-west direction. These oysters opened and closed their valves in a rhythm with the tides. The animals were shipped in a tight, opaque containers filled with seawater. Upon arrival, they were stored in a lab with no natural daylight. On first examination, the oysters geared to the rhythm of the tides in Long Island. They kept opening and closing their valves. In about two weeks, they started shifting their rhythm to the, they started shifting their rhythm. And a while later, they stabilized in a rhythm that coincided with the passage of the moon over Evanston, Illinois. In this case, we may assume that the oysters are indeed rhythm entertained by the gravitational effects of the moon. Wow. I just, yeah, it's so interesting. I want what, if what does, I know the moon, I feel like definitely affects us, but like what? What else affects our rhythm? Like pulls on us. Get out of there, son. Get out of there. <clears throat> However, it is not only we, the tiny creatures of this planet, who are rhythm entertained. The big and mighty asteroids and the planets themselves are rhythm entertained and develop resonances in their orbits as they rotate about the sun. Asteroids, which are minor planets, will not only respond to the gravitational pull of the sun, but will also be strongly affected by the gravitational fields of the major planets. They must dance, so to speak, to the tune of two masters. And so the asteroids develop little dances to the music of the spheres in which they pay tribute to the forces involved. They go into resonant orbits and describe minor, and describe minor loops around the planets within a major loop around the sun. All the phenomena described in this chapter are of periodic repetitive nature. We have made a generalization at the beginning saying that when such a rhythmic movement occurs, it affects its environment, whether that environment is air, water, solid, electromagnetic, or gravitational fields. In the case of air, water, or solid, these vibrations will affect our near environment, our near environment only, and can be called sound. If we shake our electromagnetic or gravitational fields, the disturbance in the environment will travel faster and further. We will still apply the word sound to it, although it will be a sound of a different kind, since it would travel at the velocity of light. We could actually associate our whole reality with sound. Sorry, we could actually associate our whole reality with sound of one kind or another because our reality is, vibrator is a vibratory reality. And there is nothing static in it. Everything moves, everything is vibrating. Nothing is static in our reality. That's like, yes. Starting with the nucleus of an atom, which vibrates at enormous rates. The electrons and the molecules are all associated with characteristics with characteristic vibratory rates. A most important aspect of matter is its vibratory energy. When we think of our brains, when we think, sorry, when we think our brains produce rhythmic electric currents. So this is what it's like when you're hanging out with the homies and you're just hanging out and you guys are just not even saying anything. There's there's sound waves being tossed around all y'all. So that, that's you guys. When you're hanging out, when there's more than one person, you, all your thoughts are bouncing off each other, truly. Telepathy is here. We just got to find out how to access it. So that's what it's like when you're hanging out with whoever you like to hang out with. And you guys have a thought. If you have a thought, that thought's traveling. It's sound waves are traveling. Isn't that wild? When we think our brains pursue, sorry. When we think our brains produce rhythmic electric currents. Let's go. Power in thoughts. with their magnetic components. They spread out into space at a velocity of light. So my thought, this, I'm gonna have a thought right now. <laughs> I just sent it out into space. Space aliens are gonna get that thought one day. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna do, start from the top. Check it out. When we think our brains produce rhythmic electric currents with their magnetic components, they spread out into space at a velocity of light, as do the elective waves or sound produced by our hearts. They all mingle from they all mingle to form enormous interference patterns spreading out and away from the planet. So this is what it's like when you're hanging out 
when you're hanging out with whoever you like to hang out with, your boys, your girls, the homies, whatever it is, this is you guys having thoughts. All those thoughts are being sent into space. That's why thoughts are important. Space aliens are looking down at you guys being like, what are you guys talking about? Okay. They are admittedly weak, but they are there. The more finely our systems are tuned, the clearer a signal we can pick out of the general noise and jumble of sounds. When we have a system of tuned oscillators, even the tiniest signal can be picked up. You may recall that it requires very little energy of the correct frequency to drive a resonant system. Our planet itself is producing shock waves in the plasma that fills the solar system. These shock waves interact with those caused by other planets and produce resonances between the planets and the asteroids. In short, our whole reality is based on one common factor, that the periodic change or sound are that, oh, sorry. In short, our whole reality is based on one common factor, and that is periodic change or sound. Our senses are geared to respond to all these different sounds, but we are always comparing one sound with another. We can appreciate only the differences in sound. And he has a nice, we're gonna get into a summary, but this is the symbol of this for the sound chapter. I kind of like it, kind of helps you remember. Sound starts in one point and resonates out in all directions infinitely. All that energy we make. Summary. So let's go over kind of the big the big picture here. The big picture. Why it's important. We have seen various ways of producing sound. We know that when a string or any other structure vibrates, it may develop standing waves. These are waves that occupy a fixed position in any structure, whether it is a string, a plate, a container filled with liquid, or a blood vessel. Nodes are the spots in which minimum motion occurs. When sets of waves are superimposed, interference patterns result. A hologram is an interference pattern of light waves on a photographic plate. When two differing frequencies are superposed, are superposed, beat frequencies result, like our heart. Coherency is an in-step or in-phase behavior of waves. Oscillators are devices that move in a periodic repetitive fashion between two points of rest. Our bodies are also such devices. Oscillators vibrating out of phase with each other may get locked into phase through rhythm entertainment. A system of oscillators that is in phase can resonate. Our reality is a vibratory reality filled by sounds of different kinds. We respond to differences in these sounds. There you have it, folks. That is Sunrise Book Club for today. Oh, I got kicked out. Whoa, whoa, well, look at that. Well, just right, just right when we end. Wow, look at that. So let's go to the new scene. This morning we read from Stalking the Wild Consciousness. I mean Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Cautiousness Consciousness by Itzak Bentov. The reason I'm reading through this, what put it on my radar was learning that this book was the basis for the CIA's look into consciousness and uh, psychic abilities uh, it that you could look it up today it's been declassified it's the gateway project and you'll, you'll notice especially if you keep hanging out with me while i read this um you'll notice a lot of the diagrams from this book are in that actual pdf so that's why i picked it up we just started today we went through the introduction in chapter one we learned about how our universe how our reality is one of sound and how sound can carry information how sound is uh, important in creating holograms. We're learning about sound waves and how they travel, bounce off each other, and can create holograms and store information itself. We will continue reading this book next Thursday. That is going to be the plan from here on out. And next week, we get to jump into a look through the super microscope. So we're learning about more of the small parts of nature, and we're going to look at what is through the super microscope. What are the smallest microstructures that we've discovered? And that will be next Thursday. So get ready for that fun. But thank you all for joining me for Sunrise Book Club. If you want to stick around, I'll be playing some games now. Which game? I don't know. But let's see. You know, I did. Get, I got the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe recently. I do love it. Let's see. Let me go back there. Try and get some more endings. Warm this morning up the mountain. 
Okay, let's see. We got the Stanley Parable. I'm going to switch this really quick, though, to just chatting. Honestly, interesting though. It really makes me think because I, I when you're when you're when you're on the TikToks on the internet, you're cruising through. There's so many uh, conspiracy things everywhere. So many simulation theories, th theory stuff. Uh, reading about the sound waves and how a hologram is made, and how sound carries information, and I'm sure we're gonna learn in the next two chapters, chapter two and three, and four, how light can hold information as well. Um, so I'm really excited to keep going with this because it makes you think about like, you know, people's idea of the simulation theory being more of a, like how you see in the movies or the matrix, like you're more plugged into something or like there's someone running it, you know, running the simulation or there'd be aliens, whatever you believe in. For me, it's all just the universal consciousness and then anything, or I'm starting to think that through more reading. I mean, I'm not that I know anything. You just get more confused the more you learn about this stuff. But for me, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like a holographic, like reality we live in. But we are, it's not, I don't think it's a, a simulation like there's another group or a person running the simulation for us or like getting our energy or something nefarious from it. I'm more leaning towards the idea that it is, not that I know it all, not that any of us will ever know what the purpose is, but... For me, it's like there's a universal consciousness and we are just kind of like whether whatever word you want to use, whether it be avatars or, you know, uh, dreams of the consciousness. We are just existing in this 3D reality, 3D dimension of the consciousness and we're all connected to it. We are all of one in many different ways. Uh, and with the sound thing, we're, we're all interacting with each other constantly. My thoughts are sending off sound waves. That's insane to me. So that it just makes sense when people get vibes or they feeling weird about someone. You, you might actually be picking up on the fact that that person's having like very strange thoughts at the moment. So, you know, very interesting. Pay, always pay attention to your instincts. That's, that, that, that's what the lesson is, I think. But let's see, look at my games here. What, what's, what's the mood this morning? Do I wanna get people, do I wanna shoot people in the head with arrows? 